the king is back. Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy clap back at the ETF issuers by purchasing more Bitcoin to stay on top for now. We also do a deep dive on the difference between the ETFs and MicroStrategy stock. Plus, what is going on in China's stock market? And with New York Community Bank's stock down over 70% this year alone, are we about to see the reemergence of bank runs here in the U.S.? Time to jump into the lifeboat. Welcome to the Wednesday, February 7th edition of the Bitcoin ETF Daily Show. I'm Dante Cook, head of Swan Business. In this show, we discuss the latest news, events, winners, losers, and key information surrounding these historic Bitcoin ETFs, plus some other Bitcoin daily news. Here at Swan, we're on a mission to educate the world about Bitcoin, so please like this video and subscribe to the channel to help us break through the noise and extend our reach here on YouTube. Sometimes the king just has to show these newcomers who's boss. Like Kevin Durant dunking on Giannis, Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy clap back at the new ETF issuers, showing them that they still have a little gas in the tank. MicroStrategy purchased an additional 850 Bitcoin for $37.2 million, bringing its total corporate treasury holdings to 190,000 Bitcoin. MicroStrategy isn't just a business intelligence company. It's a Bitcoin development company. Their strategy is to take excess cash that they generate from the business, equity, and debt, and use it to buy more Bitcoin to increase shareholder value. And I would say that that strategy is working, as MicroStrategy's Bitcoin position is now valued at $2.2 billion in profit. MicroStrategy's stock has outperformed even Bitcoin since they adopted their Bitcoin-only strategy in August of 2020. In their earnings presentation, MicroStrategy lays out why they believe that their stock is a superior investment asset compared to the spot Bitcoin ETFs. Here are a couple benefits that they point out. For one, they have no management fees. Secondly, they're able to control their capital stack and do creative things in the capital markets as an operating company. When they feel that their company is overvalued relative to Bitcoin, they can issue more shares to increase their Bitcoin holdings. When they see opportunities to acquire debt, they can do that too, like they did back in 2020 and 2021, where they were able to borrow at rates near 0% to acquire Bitcoin, which obviously appreciated faster than their debt payments on that interest. The other obvious benefit is that they can plow cash flow from their business operations back into Bitcoin. The ETFs can't do that. We'll chat a little bit more about MicroStrategy later. But for now, on to our flows. The nine new ETFs collectively are just 2,744 Bitcoin shy of MicroStrategy's holdings of 190,000 Bitcoin. BlackRock is first with 76,750 Bitcoin, representing about 3.3 billion in assets under management. Fidelity is behind them in second with roughly 63,661 Bitcoin valued at about $2.6 billion. ARK sits in third place with 16,615 Bitcoin, and they're set to cross the $700 million mark in assets under management today. GBTC's outflows continue to decline. They had outflows of just $72.7 million yesterday. In terms of flows year to date, BlackRock sits at number five and Fidelity sits at number eight, beating 99.9% .9 of all other ETFs in the total market. As we talk about often on this show, Bitcoin is highly correlated to M2 global money supply. But don't just look at the M2 money supply. There's about $6 trillion in money market funds sitting on the sideline that could also plow into this asset. Even if a small percentage goes to Bitcoin, be prepared for a supply shock. Don't get distracted by CPI numbers. The M2 money supply train has gone too far. That's the number to track. Here's our interesting fact for the day. Only those who purchase Bitcoin at the absolute top of the previous cycle in 2021 or those who purchased it right when the ETFs were launched are the only people not in profit. Everyone else is in the green. In other interesting news for the day, Janet Yellen is trying to throw spaghetti at the wall by trying to get Congress to pass legislation on crypto. Council is focused on digital assets and related risks such as runs, such as from runs on crypto asset platforms and stable coins, potential vulnerabilities from crypto asset price volatility, and the proliferation of platforms acting outside of or out of compliance with applicable laws and regulations. 
applicable rules and regulations should be enforced, and Congress should pass legislation to provide for the regulation of stable coins and of the spot market for crypto assets that are not securities. It's interesting that she says that she wants them to regulate crypto assets that are not securities. According to the IRS, the SEC, and the CFTC, Bitcoin is not a security. It's a commodity. It's property. It'll be interesting to see how regulators decide to label Ethereum, which is clearly a centralized token, and meets all the criteria that they use to judge securities, which is the Howey test. What's actually happening in China? It's pretty clear that they have a nasty balance sheet recession on their hands. If Japan has taught us anything, you can't fix that problem by just lowering interest rates. Once deleveraging starts to happen, people won't just borrow more because interest rates are lower. They're trying to find ways to exit and flee the system. Their best opportunity to stop a balance sheet recession is by targeted fiscal stimulus, like the U.S. did in 2009. China can step in like the U.S. did in 2009 and use its balance sheet to inject capital to real estate developers and households directly, allowing them to repair their balance sheets over time. Or they could just FOMO into Bitcoin. Their citizens are already doing it, even though it's banned. And back to news from U.S. domestic markets. New York Community Bank, which acquired Silicon Valley Bank, which went bust last year, dropped another 17% yesterday. In his 60-minute interview, Uncle Rome, or Fed Chair Jerome Powell, announced that there could be regional bank collapses in 2024. New York Community Bank may be the domino that falls first, as their stock is down 70% in 2024 alone, erasing over $7 billion in market cap value. While this may not bleed out into larger banks for a long time, this absolutely foreshadows that there could be other regional banks that will collapse in the near term. It might make sense for you to think about becoming your own bank. In unsurprising news, Monero rug pulled its users again, being down another 30% after being delisted from Binance. The good news is that at least these losses were private. Monero, like every other centralized crypto token, thought that they could defy the laws of the blockchain trilemma. The blockchain trilemma says that you can only solve for two of the three, scalability, security, and decentralization. All of these tokens that claim that they can solve for all three are just lying to you. Bitcoin lives in a world of truth and mathematics. It doesn't solve the scalability problem, but it does solve security and decentralization better than anything out there in the world. That was the novel invention of Bitcoin. Don't be fooled by the Web3 crypto scams that say you can have it all. As our friend Matt Cratter says, Monero runs up to the walls of Troy naked and gets slaughtered. Bitcoin is the Trojan horse that helps you sack Troy itself. And with our final thoughts for the day, Let's go back to Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy. Michael Saylor has been playing chess while everyone else has been playing checkers. Since founding MicroStrategy in 1989, he's seen the rise of the internet, the rise and fall of the dot-com bubble. He survived the great financial crisis. He's also seen the rise of SaaS tools in the data visualization market, and now the transformation of financial markets. There is nobody else in public markets that has navigated as much or seen as much as Michael Saylor. The Lindy Effect says that something that's been around for a long time is likely to continue to stay around. It's ironic that Nassim Taleb, who popularized the term, fails to grasp that this is true for MicroStrategy, and it's absolutely true for Bitcoin. One, it's not an inflation hedge. Two, the thing is, it may be good for transaction, for petty transactions, small, small amount of money, but it's not good for real money laundering because it's very traceable. (laughs) And three, it is... Pretty much in the right. first time in the history of the world, we have had a cult, you know, a right. cult coupled with a financial what instrument. Do you- Bitcoin is not a Ponzi. Bitcoin is not a tulip. Bitcoin is not a cult. Bitcoin is not Monero. Bitcoin is not a hex token. Bitcoin is not Solana or Ethereum. Bitcoin is not a security. Bitcoin is not simultaneously good for money laundering and bad for money laundering. Bitcoin is an idea, an idea whose time has come. Bitcoin is open source technology. Bitcoin is freedom. Bitcoin is a decentralized store of value accessible to billions around the globe. It's the black swan that you never saw coming. Every new block it makes, the network solidifies and ossifies itself as a financial asset that's here to stay. And with that, we're signing off for today. I'm Dante Cook with swan.com. Happy stacking.